this piece is actually part of a, a longer series of works. Uh, it's number three in a series of four uh, that I call the Red Pieces. Uh, and in these works, I'm we, because it's this group has been with me for two of the uh, pieces. Uh, we work on how sexuality uh, is not only something intimate and private to keep behind closed doors, but actually also something that is part of the social and how society is built and in how politics function. And so this piece is the more uh, celebratory uh, side of the cycle, where some of the other works uh, also go into the more darker sides of power structures or power um, inequalities uh, in relation to uh, sexuality. But this work for me has more to do um, with looking at the, the body as a space for experimentation and also sexuality as a space for experimentation. So to try to um, set up ways of being together that are different from the ones we know. Am I speaking too quick or is it fine? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. I have been mm, experiencing an increase of sexual imagery over the last 15 uh, years and also with the arrival of the internet, the circulation of sexual imagery has increased <coughs> quite radically. And uh, at the same time also this idea of exposing oneself, so on social media for instance there is something about how intimate information is all of a sudden circulate on very big uh, platforms or networks. So that what I uh, experience is that the border between the private and the public is no longer a clearly drawn line, but it's rather something that oscillates. Um, and this was somehow one of the reasons I thought looking at sexuality in the public, so in the theater, uh, was an interesting way of trying to deal um, with those questions of how the intimate sphere is no longer closed off behind doors, but it's also um, visible in many different um, instances of society. Maybe we could add, were you embarrassed? No. No. Um, I, I don't, embarrassment is, is not um, what I'm searching for, but uh, there's of course, of course, uh, when you perform, um, let's say the, the orgasm choir, for instance, there is a very clear address and a very direct address, and in a way, um, to do an orgasm as a choir is of course, um, a strange thing perhaps to do but what we try to do is to deal with it as a musical score and to really perform it as precisely as possible uh, from what we hear in our ears and it's a way for me it has to do with how the sound of sex is also a cultural phenomenon so the fact that we all sound more or less the same I think these, this orgasm is particularly extreme perhaps it's a multiple and goes on and on but, uh, but there is something about, for instance, in Japan, I have found out in the course of things that, that the tonality and the pitch is much higher than in Europe. So there is also a, a cultural understanding of how we actually should sound when we have sex. And so this is part of this uh, idea that the cultural uh, and the sexual is, is deeply um, intertwined uh, and so I'm, I'm more yeah I find that funny actually so it's more working on the the humor of that and in a way also the playful like a certain play with those codes uh, because of course you can also fake orgasms and it can give you pleasure to fake an orgasm as well and on stage as well so uh, it has to do with with that kind of uh, maybe freedom with how you treat these kinds of materials. Allora dice no, non ha nessuna intenzione di mettere in imbarazzo, ma dice quando si mostra in modo diretto un orgasmo, qui come un coro, è qualcosa di strano. È in questo caso una partitura musicale precisa da eseguire con la maggior precisione possibile. Il suono del sesso è un fenomeno culturale. Un po' tutti nella nostra cultura risuoniamo allo stesso modo, che qui è estremizzato. Nei suoi, nelle sue ricerche lei ha scoperto che in Giappone, per esempio, al momento dell'orgasmo c'è un suono più breve e più alto. E 
quindi c'è un modo in ogni cultura di come si dovrebbe risuonare e cultura e sesso sono molto legati e, è una scoperta che porta molti stimoli anche a giocare su un versante di humor a giocare con questo finto orgasmo che può comunque dare un piacere a cercare una libertà di trattamento in questa materia e, e perché Why did you want? <laughs> My Italian is getting better for every minute that passes every here. Every day you um, Why Lindy Hop? Um, so, it, it's, this piece is actually based on a piece I did 12 years ago, so it's a kind of extended version of an older uh, performance, and at the time um, I was very busy with looking at the couple structure and how to undo it, so how to destroy the couple structure as the dominant uh, structure of society. And so I was looking for a dance that in a way would come from the time when the couple structure was maybe the only imaginable one. So this dance is from the 30s. It was developed within the black communities of the United States and it was appropriated quite violently by white people at the time. But then since then it has a long history of having been danced in many different contexts. So there was in the 80s and 90s also a movement in Europe where people started dancing it quite ex extensively um, as a social um, dance and also as a tribute to, to the roots of this uh, dance. And, uh, and what was interesting to me about this dance is that you have a leader and a follower and it does not necessarily have to be a man who is the leader and a woman who is the follower, so there is a kind of interchangeability between men and women, so that's also what we do in the piece, some of the women are leaders and some of the men are followers. Um, And, uh, and so the whole dance it, um, that we do is based on how to decompose the relation and kind of circulate between the couples and that the partners are permanently changing. Um, and then the second reason to choose it is also this very energetic and joyful um, sensation which I think it produces. And for me, like joy is also, um, uh, it, it's a way to think about sexuality which is uh, free of repression, because I think there's a lot of repression going on in, in sexuality in, in general, but I think that the joyful can be a, a way out of that, and perhaps a bit naively a way out, but I think it, momentarily I think it, it, it can work, or it kind of works, so, uh, so that's a, yeah, a, a second reason. Allora, l'Indie Hop, come sapete, è una danza popolare afroamericana di una certa epoca, e lei ha ripreso in mano eh, un pezzo, infatti questo nel titolo eh, ha extended, un pezzo che aveva fatto 12 anni fa, lo ha ampliato e quel pezzo aveva come tema centrale la struttura di coppia, che è una struttura dominante nella società e lo era all'epoca in cui è nato il Lindy Hop, era una struttura portante e indiscussa. E, Dopodiché questa danza ha viaggiato uh, nel tempo, nello spazio, è arrivata in Europa, è diventata una social dance con, uh, come omaggio a quelle radici di, di un popolo, di un'epoca. È diventata più libera nel senso che eh, quella che era la coppia con l'uomo alla guida eh, si conforma adesso su una figura di leader, una figura di follower, chi guida e chi segue, che non necessariamente sono un uomo o una donna, ma sono intercambiabili. E questa danza social, diventata social, adesso decompone, scompone la relazione uomo-donna e la fa ricircolare nel gruppo. Poi un'altra ragione per scegliere l'indie hop è che c'è una bella energia, c'è gioia e questo fa, fa bene alla sensualità perché eh, lei pensa che ci sia ancora molta repressione e che ci sia bisogno di rimuoverla, che la gioia anche ingenua eh, ci aiuta a liberarci da queste barriere. Uh, so the nude is meant to be a tool to be free to express what's it? La nudità è uno strumento per liberare l'espressione di sé? Um, in 
in a way, yes and no, uh, because the, I think uh, the whole research that I have done uh, on this series of work has also been looking at the sexual liberation movement of the 1960s. And in the 60s, I think that nudity was, in a way, used as a tool um, to liberate certain social structures and also to protest against uh, the Vietnam War in the US, for instance, and it has been used in many different ways. Um, but I also think it was very clear that uh, the naked body got also recaptured by capitalism, basically, by how images use um, the naked body as a, as a tool to sell products. And I think this is still very much the state that we are in. Um, so I think it's difficult uh, to be free, <laughs> to be naked and to be free. <laughs> So the, the, we have been speaking a lot about this, of how to actually compose a certain, um, a certain structure that actually uh, creates this excess energy that for me is a liberatory energy, but it's not something that just happens because we dance around naked. So it, it has to do with a very strong, actually constructivist uh, sense of how to think about nudity and also how to, to compose other relations than the ones that are very easily available in the world uh, as, as we see it outside. So, so yeah, yes and no. Uh, dice sì, sì e no, perché tutta la sua ricerca è stata anche una ricerca storica. La nudità come strumento di liberazione e di protesta eh, la ritrovata negli anni 60 quando si facevano magari sit-in contro la guerra del Vietnam, però poi è successo che il corpo nudo eh, è stato ripreso in mano dal sistema capitalista e dalla necessità di vendere delle cose usando l'immagine del corpo nudo, quindi è molto difficile essere nudi e liberi e per questa ragione ha composto una preparato una struttura molto puntuale in modo da poter esprimere dentro una struttura e non così ci togliamo i vestiti e cominciamo a balzellare in giro, a esprimere dentro una struttura precisa un atto di libertà, eh, quindi è importante che sia costruito tutto questo. Eh, I have a, another question. What's pornography for you? Uh, yeah. Well, it's uh, well. It's in uh, with this series of works that I have done. I have gotten the question many times how I relate to pornography, and the last, the fourth piece that I decided to make uh, is actually called 21 Pornographies and it was a way to try to directly answer that question at least for myself. I don't think the work um, that I have been doing, so the first three, for me they're not actually about pornography but they're about sexuality as a more open field. Um, and in a way for me, pornography, I think there's as many uh, categorizations as you can imagine, like you can find any kind of pornography online today. Uh, but for me, I am thinking about pornography more like a structure. So, uh, a structure that has to do with efficiency. I don't know if this is clear, but it's a structure that... Uh, so if you, for instance, would think about other uh, instances of society, like for instance, how uh, news footage is working, where you have these breaking news as a kind of orgasmic or climactic situation that then is, um, f let's say, frustrated once there is no more news, and then the search for new news that can produce this media um, grab on the public uh, starts. So, for instance, that would for me be a, an example of a societal pornographic use of images um, and I think uh, cliffhangers in, in television series could be another one where you have this kind of, uh, you build up and then to make sure that people come back to see the next thing, you, you create this cliffhanger at the end of a, of a series. So me, for me this is pornographic structures. Um, so in a way pornography is everything, it's uh, <laughs> in these terms. But then on a more, um, on a, on a more uh, 
precise level, I, I started to look at the history of pornography. You're going to have a lot to translate now. <laughs> And so I've been looking at literary pornography, so how, um, for instance, in Makita Saad and the writings of Makita Saad, there is a, uh, pornography is a literary form that is also connected to humor and to parody. Um, I have been looking at uh, Danish pornography from the 1970s, where um, the image pornography of the 60s, like let's say in Denmark, the image was liber the pornographic image was liberated in 67. And after that, there was this whole wave of pornographic films that were made that I find quite interesting uh, because they're an expression of this liberation movement, but also of the commercialization of the naked body again. So I've been looking at that, those things, and I've even been looking at pornography as uh, more like in terms of war pornography. So how uh, power and violence and brutality is also connected um, to the pornographic. Uh, and that those things are directly expressed in, in this work that I mentioned before, 21 Pornographies. <laughs> allora, eh, come mi relaziono? Beh, lei ha fatto dopo questo un pezzo che si chiama 21 Pornografie perché voleva anzitutto rispondere per se stessa, a se stessa a questa domanda che ha, secondo lei ha in linea generale ha a che fare con un'idea di efficienza che circola nella nostra società. Per esempio le breaking news, no? nei canali di news, 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 crea come una dipendenza per cui vuoi sempre la novità della notizia e, e cerchi di più, notizia sempre più eclatante, no? oppure le serie televisive eh, che piacciono No, anche a me, è che ogni puntata deve mh, lanciarti un richiamo perché tu torni su quel programma e questo è un, un uso pornografico del, del mezzo televisivo e filmico. Parlando più addentro al tema più preciso, lei si è un po' anche interessata e dice sarebbe un lungo discorso alla storia della pornografia per esempio quella che si trova in letteratura il Marchese de Sade ma anche allo humor alla parodia e in Danimarca dal 67 eh, c'è stata la possibilità di si è liberato il mercato della pornografia e da allora sono stati fatti molti film eh, che sono da un, per un verso portatori di liberazione e per l'altro di consumo, di commercializzazione e quindi dentro c'è anche la violenza, c'è anche una lotta di potere, è molto, è molto ambiguo, è molto complesso questo argomento. Eh, domande? Sì. Um, so it, this color was first selected um, because of the blue key screens that you use in cinema. Uh, so these are screens that allow um, cinematographers to film, for instance, a cliffhanger, cliff scene where someone has to hang and it's very dangerous. And then afterwards you can replace the background. So it's a, it's a technique for projection actually. So how to take away something or add something to an image. So the, the idea was to use this blue as a kind of screen of protection, but onto the bodies. So, and, uh, and then I also like it very much. So it's also about a certain uh, visual, it also creates a certain plastic uh, effect on the bodies and like artificiality and even almost like android looking skin. It becomes like a second skin. Um, And, and the, the way it's, the suits are created also create a certain kind of ali, alien uh, body. So there's also that aspect to it. Io ho pensato, c'è un blue cline e c'è un blue mente. You know the blue cline and this is the blue mente. Eh, dice, eh, 
l'idea è partita dal blue screen che è un strumento per poter cambiare il fondale nelle riprese cinematografiche e televisive o togliere e mettere degli elementi e hanno provato questo colore piaciuto e anche con uno schermo di protezione quello che permette appunto di togliere e mettere ciò che si desidera da un'immagine e anche un bel effetto plastico un effetto artificiale un effetto seconda pelle e un effetto un po' di corpo alieno quindi aveva tutte le caratteristiche per funzionare which again has to do with this, what I described before about the climactic, so how uh, many performances are of course also built according to certain ideas of climax. And, uh, and so there is an idea about instead of creating climax that builds and then frustrates and builds again, to create like planes, like flat, flat planes that endure for a certain amount of time. So each of the, the blue part, for instance, of course there's micro modulations inside, but it is intentionally long and also exhaustive so it's like all the different uh, combinatorics of the body and the connections that are possible uh, to make um, and it's also sculptural of course and it's also a, a sen for me it's also about sensation maybe another sensation than if you know you would do a very um, different rhythm in it so it's about a s kind of slowed down rhythm uh, in the orgasm choir, it's this multi the idea of the multiple. So normally in orgasm you have one and then afterwards it's over for a while before. So the idea that it endures and goes on and on and that there's also this cyclical repetition. And in the dance it's a bit the same thing. So normally Lindy Hop is very often used um, in films, for instance, as a little scene, two minutes to give some energy. And so it was also the idea of how to actually dance this dance. It's very tiring for the dancers. They are really giving all they have uh, in this, because it's quite long. I mean, it's a, it's a long sequence to be doing this particular dance in. And so it's also, uh, yeah, it was an attempt to try to get away from the, these little peaks of energy, but rather to create these sustained blocks of, of energetic uh, charge or discharge. So that it doesn't do the like that. So some of them are here, maybe, maybe we we worked. It was this piece is made in quite short time. So, but it is of course. Uh, uh, we, ha we have worked together, or the, the group is composed out of uh, people who have also made another piece together plus five extra other people because this group is bigger than the previous one. So for me it was very important uh, in order to do this work because it's quite intimate and because it involves also touching each other in places where usually you don't touch people that you're not in a, some sort of relationship with. Um, so it was to try to set up a way where this work was possible. Uh, the suits, they were in a way helpful because all the, all the constructions of the blue part are really made with the, the blue suits on. And, uh, and not from, yeah, try, like it's, it's all composed so actually you don't know who you are connecting to. Um, and and yeah, and the but the parts as it's a piece that's based on a previous piece, the parts were were in a way clear before we started. Uh, so in that sense, it was a different process than when we did Seven Pleasures, which is a piece that was built from scratch with the same uh, performance. So we we have been through different kinds of uh, work together. Do you guys want to say something in relation to that? No. So, and the dancing is very composed, so everything is, it's usually a social dance that is improvised and uh, we practiced it improvised, but in the end everything is written, so even when it looks free, it's like it's written down to the smallest detail even, like it's, it's quite uh, set as a, as a choreographic structure. And it's really something we, we it's, it's, was, it's quite a thing to figure out, so it was a lot of hours of hard work learning the dance because also we didn't know the dance uh, before uh, so the 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 work of actually 
yeah, getting into the material was quite um, laborious and also, uh, in a way, uh, uh, very tiring and very joyful at the, the same time. I would say there's also a certain level of enjoyment in it. There's another. A wonderful play, wonderful dance, wonderful performance. Uh, I am uh, carrying in myself a vision of the northern countries very liberate sexually. Uh, this is my inner world. So I'm looking at the show with a different vision, maybe with uh, some other uh, people from the audience. My question is, how do you deal with uh, the singular, special, unique uh, perception of each of us? I don't. <laughs> No, no. Uh, I. For, it's very interesting what you ask about the. I, um, I was curious actually when coming to play here, how this work would be received in a culture that is different from the one that I'm coming from. But obviously, uh, I don't know in which ways it is different. So um, yeah, I. I I, I don't know, I think that every, it's always the case with performances that each spectator has a singular experience that is partly cultural and partly part of your own history and the way you look. I don't think too much about it because you cannot think about 5,000 people's how they might look at something. So I try to work from um, my point of view and what I am interested in, in communicating and then I hope that it resonates with, with people, so, so like no matter where they come from when they come to see the, the show. But maybe that's not what you meant. Well, it's, it's getting close. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, uh, it's not a criticism. It is a, um, we tend, uh, when we think about literature, to speak about the author, about the text, but very rarely about the reader. And uh, obviously, each reader may have a very specific uh, way to uh, dive and swim in the whatever uh, text he, he or she is reading. And uh, somehow, you may have a perspective that is author-driven, rather, or maybe uh, culturally driven, rather than uh, answering my question, which would be, how could we deal, or how would you like, or how would you imagine you could deal with my inner world, or any very specific inner world of each of us, yeah. in a very, uh, not in a broad way where everybody would feel the same. No. I mean, I'm very much someone who believes that each artwork is actually written in the one who receives it. So it's a, there's a, lots of theories uh, around the, how the author is dead and that all texts, they come alive in the moment that you read them or see them. So for me, uh, I think this process is always happening with all art reception. Um, I think uh, working as an artist, it's impossible to include all these possible ways of looking. So I think the singularity of the, the position of making and the dialogues that I have had with the dancers in order to create this work is, is, the, is what I try to focus on because if not I will be lost. I will be swimming in, in all kinds of... Uh, but it is an interesting question because of course this work in certain cultures cannot be shown because in certain cultures nudity is not possible and uh, so they, this expression is obviously... it is culturally... Um, Based. It is based on a certain cultural position that's, that is difficult to, it's quite a clear one uh, because of the nudity and because of the, the, the sexual expression. No, I think I, in my, like uh, when I was young I looked a lot at Rodin and these like uh, really figurative sculptures. I also saw an exhibition of Rowan Newick who makes these extremely realistic sculptures with hair and everything like but it's not a direct inspiration. I actually, we, we worked, uh, or originally when the piece was made, I was working on the engravings of Marquis de Sade, which are very imaginative engravings 
that uh, where you think, for instance, the ass pile with the four asses on top of each other, it's on one of these images and had this, this must be impossible to do. So it had to do with this, what, is po what kind of positions are possible and impossible, and how can we try to create these sculptures that would somehow also go towards the impossible. Uh, so it's more coming from, from those kinds of images, and then the general practices that we developed while making the piece.